Chapter 5 In Bosra, my two brothers and I had always gone to Friday prayers at the mosque with Baba. I'd enjoyed it. We'd had to put on nice clothes and Baba had usually been in a good mood. On the way there, he'd sometimes told us stories about his own father and the last he'd had with his brothers. Those were the only times I'd really loved my father, if I'm honest. We used to meet friends at the Bosra Mosque, as well as uncles and cousins. Even Ford had his own gang of five-year-old kids. Musa and I had done years of classes at Quranic school, of course, so we knew all the prayers. I liked standing and kneeling with everyone as we said them. It made me feel part of something good, something bigger than myself. But I didn't look forward to Friday Paris in Dara. The mosque would be full of people we didn't know. The thing that really bothered me, though, was the thought of running into someone from school. After that first day, things had improved for me. Even though Farad was still like a simmering volcano, apt to erupt unpredictably into violence. Most of the boys were reasonably friendly, but I hated the idea of them seeing me at the mosque with Baba. What would they think of him? I was sure of all the other fathers that they'd be tall and good-looking, not small and skinny like Baba. And then his teeth were just so embarrassing. The nearest mosque to our flat was quite small. I had a good look round as I kicked off my shoes at the doorway. I had to admit that it was actually quite nice inside, high and airy with beautiful tiles on the walls and thick carpets covering the floor. We went into the washroom and I was rolling up Ford's sleeves, ready to scrub his forearms. Baba was very particular about being thorough in the ritual wash before prayers. When I caught the sight, all of a sudden, opposite, I felt a flutter of fear. What if he said anything dodgy in front of my father? Bazem saw Musa and gave a tiny nod, and Musa slightly raised his hand before turning away. The fact they were pretending not to know each other alarmed me even more. When the prayers were over, someone came up to talk to Baba. I could tell from what he said that he worked at the Ministry of Agriculture too. Ford was being a bit frisky, so I grabbed hold of his hand to keep him still. I certainly didn't want this smart-looking stranger to think that our family was badly behaved. I guess he was quite important, judging by the way that Baba was smiling and agreeing with every word he said. It was quite a while before I realised that Musa wasn't with us. I looked round and saw his unmistakable brush was sticking up black hair at the far end of the big mosque courtyard. He was almost at the gate that led to the street. Luckily, at that moment, Baba's colleague paused to cough and I grabbed the chance to say to Baba, Moose has gone on. I'd better catch him up. He nodded. Take Ford with you. I pretended I hadn't heard that last bit and hurried off after Musa. I kept my eyes fixed firmly on him, trying not to lose sight of him in the crowd. But even then, I nearly missed the moment when it happened. Bazem brushed up alongside Musa, and without either of them saying a word or even looking at each other, he slipped something into the pocket of Musa's trousers. I felt a rush of rage and darted through the crowd after him. Then I heard Ford call out, Omar, wait for me! Ford's wail made me stop and look back. My annoying little brother was worming his way between two tall men struggling to reach me. Go back to Baba, I told him sharply. I want to come with you, he said sticking out his lower lip obstinately. You can't, Ford. Look, get Baba to buy you some sweets. He will if you ask him nicely. He looked uncertain, but I gave him a little shove and watched until I made sure he was back with Baba. By that time, of course, Musa had disappeared. The mosque courtyard was clearing quickly. People were looking anxiously, clearly, in a hurry to get home. Had I missed something? Had there been an announcement or some news? I hadn't bothered to listen to the sermon. I've been too busy wondering how Rasul was progressing on his dangerous journey to Europe. He hadn't come to say goodbye to us as he promised. All I'd had was a text message saying that his chance had come up and he'd got on a flight to Turkey. I was desperate to know if he'd done the crossing over the sea to Greece and arrived in Europe safely. There was a crowd around the gate when at last I got there and it took me a while to push through. I assumed that Musa would be on his way and set off in that direction. And it was only luck that made me look left along the side street. Musa was turning at the corner, right at the top, into the main road. I had to know what he was up to. I heard down the street and caught up with him in a few seconds later. He heard my running steps and looked round before I reached him, scowling furiously. What are you following me for? Where's Foyd? You should be looking after him. Never mind, Foyd. What the hell are you up to? 
What did Bassem give you? He flushed. H how did you... I saw him slip something into your pocket. Why all the secrecy? He hasn't given you a gun, has he? A gun? Moose's eyebrows shut up until they disappeared under his heavy fringe of black hair and he burst out laughing. Me? In my jerky hands? I can see it. Can't you? I take aim, then whoosh! <laughs> my hand flies up in the air. Oh, sorry. I, I shoot my own head off instead of yours. My mistake. <laughs> he was trying to be funny, but I refused to smile. What is it then? He glared at me. I'm only trying to protect you, you clown. Protect me? From what? And how can I go home without you? Ma will... Omar, I'm 15. I'm your older brother, in case you'd forgotten. Go on, get lost. But Ma, I've texted her. I told her I'm going to her friend's house and I'm going to borrow a book. You can't have texted Ma. You lost your mobile before we left Bosra. And bassem has been kind enough to lend me his one. It's an old one, you see. He pulled out an expensive-looking smartphone from his pocket and waved it in front of my face. I stared at it enviously. That's not an old phone. That's the latest model. Um, why the secrecy? Why didn't he just hand it to you like a normal person? Mind your own business, little brother. Now, push off. He walked away, quite fast for him. I stood there on that unfamiliar street with cars hooting their way down it and watched them go, not knowing what to do. I still didn't know my way round Dara that well, and I got a bit lost on my way home. I'd only just realised where I was when my own phone buzzed. I looked at it resentfully. It was old and the glass on the screen was cracked. There was a message from Ma. Where are you? Come home at once. Ma wrenched the door open as soon as I turned the corner of the stairwell, and as soon as I got to the top step, she reached out and dragged me inside. Imam was sitting beside her, not on her hands with worry. Where's Musa? Ma almost shouted. Where are Void and where is your father? I stared at her. Ma was often anxious about us, but this time she looked genuinely panic-stricken. Void's with Baba, Ma. I think they've gone to buy sweets. Moose has gone to his friend's house to borrow a book. We know. He texted. A man chipped in. Is he crazy? Today? So, what's the problem? They'll be back soon. Ma pushed the man aside. Problem? Don't you know what's going on? It's all over the TV. Huge anti-government demonstrations in Dara. Criminal rioters and undesirable elements on the rampage. And the whole family is out there in the middle of it. Getting into Alan knows what. What? Where's Granny? She took Nadia to visit Maja, Iman said, with a sideways glance at Ma. She's been so awful this morning. She said Ma was a... That's enough, Iman, interrupted Ma. There were bright red spots appearing on her cheeks again. There'd obviously been another row. I could just imagine Granny scooping Nadia up and marching her off to enjoy a long moan about us all with Auntie Maja. Ma was just one of her flaps, that was all. I brushed past her into the flat. I didn't see anything in town. What's for lunch? Ma smacked her hands together in exasperation. Don't you ever listen to a word I say. There isn't going to be any lunch until this whole family's safely back and in one place. You could try to help, Omar. You really could. She was really upset. I felt bad. Sorry, Ma, I mumbled. What do you want me to do? You can go round to your aunt's place and fetch Nadia home. I want her back with me. Everyone was so scared that maybe they were starting to lock themselves in their houses. And Musa, what was going to happen? My heart skipped a beat. He was just so besotted with his new friends, he'd let them lead him into all kinds of trouble. I decided to get out and broke into a run. Auntie Madge's flat was only two blocks away on the far side of the main street. Normally, you'd have to fight your way over it through streams of traffic surging along in both directions. Today, the whole road was deserted. I was about to go down the narrow street that led to Auntie Madge's flat when in the distance, I heard the rumble of heavy vehicles. Yes, I could see them now. A convoy of army lorries. They crawled slowly up the road and halted a few hundred metres away from me. Soldiers started to pile out of them. They were a scary sight. I knew I ought to get away as quickly as possible, but curiosity held me to the spot. I slipped into a shop doorway and looked out cautiously, wanting to see what would happen. 
Every other sound had been blocked out by the loud roar of the military engines. But as soon as they were turned off, I could hear shouts approaching from the opposite direction. I poked my head out of my hiding place and looked cautiously up the street. My heart was thumping with excitement and fright. A huge crowd, a vast rolling wave of people, was running down the middle of the street towards me. The ones in front were holding banners. Bold, forbidden words were blazoned on them. The regime must fall. Stop the killing. Now, I could make out the shocking, thrilling words that everyone was shouting. God, Syria, freedom. God, Syria, freedom. Something weird happened to me. I wanted more than anything to run up and join the masses of marching men and boys, to shout with them, to be part of something brave and great and glorious, even though I had no idea what it was. I was so overwhelmed that I couldn't move. I just stood there stupidly and watched the troops organising themselves, lining up to face the marchers with their guns up ready to fire, while the marchers came on fast, their banners waving, their shouting getting louder and louder, God, Syria, freedom! God, Syria, freedom! The marchers came to a halt, facing the guns. Time seemed to pause. I thought for a strange moment that I was watching something made up, a programme on the TV. But there was nothing unreal about the ear-splitting cracks of the guns when the soldiers opened fire. The wild urge to join the marchers turned into terror. I stood as if paralysed, unable to move. There were yells as the bullets hit their mark, and several people screamed. Some of the boys at the front of the line of the march jerked and toppled over onto the ground. Three or four lay still, while others were trying to roll over or crawl away. I then knew that I was seeing real soldiers, real guns, and real bullets. That was when I caught sight of Musa, my brother. My idiotic brother, who had been on the outside of the march, was hobbling along the pavement towards me, holding his precious new phone up in front of his face. He was filming the whole thing. The troops opened fire again. Straight into the crowd, more men and boys were falling, bright splashes of scarlet spreading over their clothes. I knew I needed to run to get out of the deadly range of the guns. But Musa, how could I leave him? calmly filming the mayhem, an obvious target in the most terrible danger. 